Thank you. It's five past nine on this wet and windy Tuesday night, and that's the way it's going to stay for most of the night. Cloudy tonight with periods of heavy rain. Towards dawn, it's going to become much colder, and the rain will turn to sleet. Isn't it wonderful? The low this evening, about three degrees centigrade, and it won't rise much above that tomorrow. Well, capital on a Tuesday night, and I'm very pleased to see you sitting opposite me. David Bowie. David, it's nice to see you back again. Nice to see you back again. And it's nice to be here. Yes. Glad you got in without losing too much of your hair. Anyway, welcome, and in the next two hours or so, anything can happen. Bit of sound and vision, which is basically what the next two hours is about, uh, because, uh, as, my, as you've heard, my special guest tonight is David Bowie. David, once again, nice to see you uh, back in the studio. And you're in town, um, you're in fact a, a very rare visitor to London, but you're here in town for the premiere of uh, the movie Just a Gigolo, right? Yeah. Now, the original cut of this film, when it was seen, when a lot of the press saw it, they panned it terribly. And that was the original German cut that was made. Then David Hemmings spent long days and very long nights recutting the thing, which is uh, what, in fact, the public are going to be seeing when the film goes on general release. Why was it originally cut by the Germans and then, you know, sort of left and then came out sort of uh, not actually working as well as you and David Hemmings would have hoped it would Yeah, well, as far as I can gather, um, because I was off doing my tours and whatever after the... Uh, my part in the film is over. Um, from what I understand, David went on holiday immediately after filming, and during the filming we'd had a lot of aggravation from the German production company about we wanted to do things in a particular manner, and uh, they wanted to do them in quicker time and a bit cheaper than everything that David had in mind. So we knew from the start that it was sort of some kind of... Uh, um, financial thing on the movie they wanted to save money on, on some of the corners and David went on holiday after the film by the time he got back from holiday they'd taken the thing away and they'd cut it themselves and had already started to try and sell it hmm. and David freaked at that and that, that's why the thing only came out in Germany because he was able to stop it and uh, by, by that time they, would, they were already bringing it over to England and taking it to America and showing it here there and everywhere but fortunately, David managed to get hold of all the bits and pieces mm. and stole it in the night and came back to England and uh, did his own cut in hiding. And that's the one that's now going out in England, which is David's cut, the film that he wanted to make. Have you actually seen the recut I've version? I've now seen the David's cut, yes. Yeah. Are you happy with it? Well, that? it makes sense. There's a story there. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's not just bits of incidents and all these sort of... Um, um, I suppose send-ups of the whole German period are, are back in again. I'd like to talk to you a little later about that, that whole German period and your obvious f sort of fascination for that area. Sure. Um, but what I'd like to do while you're here this evening, yeah. um, when we set this thing up, you said that you'd like to take some phone calls from our listeners. Absolutely, Because it's been a long sure. time since they've, they've talked to you. So if you do have a call for David, we're going to open the lines now. Can't promise you'll get through, but uh, it'll be really first come, first serve. 484-5255 if you do have a question for David and we'll take as many as we possibly can in the time that David is here and you've also chosen some records haven't you? Yes I have um, some really off the wall stuff <laughs> let me tell you but uh, David's got some records as well so we'll be playing some of those um, in the next uh, one hour and fifty minutes but let me, I'd like to play a track from uh, the stage album which is um, your most recent album and um, can you tell us something about this film that's coming out? Because there is a film that David Hemmings has yep. made of that whole tour. Um, well, w we had sort of great ambitions in the beginning to do some kind of surreal thing, but what we've ended up with is a very straightforward film of the concert as it stands, and I hope that it sort of matches the album. OK, let's listen to a bit of stage. I never touch you. I never touch you. Some fond memories of Earl's Court there. Uh, my guest tonight, live in the studio, is David Bowie. I always blow that one. It's 9.15, and first call up. Good evening to Caroline. Hello, Caroline. Hello. Hello. Hello, Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm oh, very well, thank you, Caroline. Thank you. I hope you got my letter amongst the hordes. Oh, I framed it. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, I'm pleased, thank you. <laughs> um, what did you want to know? Yeah, basically, um, I'm an... What do you do first? Sorry? What do you do? Well, I'm an actress after fashion, but not quite. Which fashion are you after? <laughs> uh -huh. Now, come on, you can't give me. Can. Go on. Well, basically, I'd like to know what your opinions, if you have any at all, on Stanislavski. <laughs> 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 
Well, I like his earlier stuff, but when he got into the London scene, man, and started knocking around with the punks, it all fell to pieces, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, you'd take method so far and that, but, uh... Well, he took it to New York, didn't he? It, he did. Yeah. I don't have one opinion on Stanislavski that I can think of. Oh, you do shock me there. I thought you'd have some idea of... Well, obviously you do, but I thought perhaps you were... Work well, I like things like an actor prepares the good sort of um, documents, but mm. not be really being an actor in a cinematic sense or a stage sense, rather a rock actor, it's a different sort of uh, kettle of poisson, <laughs> so to speak. Yes, I do. <laughs> Carol Caroline, I must cut you short there, because I want to get through as many calls as I possibly can, but thank you for ringing, love. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye now, the first record that you've given me, David, is um, Shapes of Things by the Yardbirds. Yeah. Why specifically this? Um... When I first heard what Keith Ralph was trying to do with uh, a rhythm and blues band, I thought it very exciting, really, for the period. He was he was putting a techno society element into um, a rhythm and blues context, and that I found very exciting at the time. Okay. Chosen by David Bowie, Yardbirds and Shapes of Things. When was the last time you heard that? Oh, about three weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> you just blown the question. What what memories does that have for you, listening back to that now? Uh, Richmond. Yeah. AA Athletic Ground. Because a year after that, you actually joined Lindsay Kemp. Yeah. Around that time. Around that period, yeah. Now, with the benefit of hindsight, it's always easier to say with the benefit of hindsight. Yeah. Do you think that actually being with Lindsay and around him at that time, that you've actually gained... That you gained a lot. I mean, a lot of what you are today. Oh is God, to that. an extraordinary amount. As you probably have gathered over the last few years, I'm pretty eclectic, and I I borrow and steal everything that fascinates me. I'm sort of a jackdaw, or is it a magpie? I never <laughs> remember. Um, and Lindsay introduced me to things like Cocteau and the Theatre of the Absurd and Antonin Atto and the, the 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 whole idea of restructuring and going against what people generally expect and uh, sometimes for the shock value, sometimes as an educational force, but whatever. But he just gave me the idea of that you can experiment with the arts and do things and take dangerous risks that you wouldn't do in real life. And mm. so you can use it as a sort of an experimental area for trying out new lifestyles without actually having to take the consequences. But you've, but you've always sort of taken those chances, haven't you, in real life? Well, yeah. Uh, when I started uh, with the characters... Um, I, I would put myself through terrible experiences and terrible positions to write about what I thought they would feel until I really cottoned onto the idea, th mainly through Brian Eno, who sort of put it more into focus for me, that you could do all the experimentation in the actual creating of the music and not actually have to put your body through the same kind of risks that you do when you put, put it through those things to write um, insights into how people go through terrible things. Because I remember seeing a film of you towards the end of the, the Ziggy era. I think it was a BBC Yeah, film. that was Alan Yentob's yeah. Omnibus. I think. Um, where, in fact, you did look like, I mean, it, the, the whole thing was just about to fall apart. A survivor, just. Yes, just. Sort of I mean, a rock on. and roll casualty. Oh, absolutely. Yes, I was. That was just before the point where I left LA. I mean, it got worse from that film. It got into a state that you wouldn't believe. And that's when, fortunately, I had friends and they they all said they were leaving me because I was just abs I was impossible to be with but to, but you put it, you actually put your body through that whole process yes and my head and yeah, every and the other whole thing <laughs> every organic part of me hmm i'd love to continue this now but in fact we'll take a break we'll continue it in about 90 seconds 20 past <laughs> 9 my guest on this tuesday night is david bowie and also on the phone is barry barry good evening good evening hi hi dave hello barry how are ya uh, not too bad, thank you, Barry. Good. Uh, I'd like to know what inspires you to write your songs at the moment, and what instruments do you write on, or do you use? Well, OK. Um, I guess I've stopped using instruments to write on. Um, I think most of the things that I do these days are on the occasion of the studio. I go in with very little preparation, but maybe some ideas of what... You see, the one thing about music is that it's the, a wonderful way of people to work together, it's a collective thing, it's one of the yeah. few things that you can do in life where you can bring so many people together and have them work in a collective capacity. Yeah. And so, utilising that kind of pre-knowledge, you go in and you just throw ideas out and you might make little experiments 
kinds of things that Brian and I were doing were sort of give, say, look, here's 50 seconds, play 10 notes in that 50 seconds, mm -hmm. and don't repeat the same note twice. And then they'd all have to do that, yeah. and then we might make that into a tape loop, and then write something over that. Yeah. That kind of feeling, rather than sitting down at a piano and writing something uh, where it's supposed to be trying to fulfil the artist's concept of something. You're There's no governor, no controller, is the point. You seem to be doing that a lot more now than you used to. Oh, I'm doing it all the time. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I, I must say, I'm still quite um, uh, a reactionary because I go back to the old songwriting techniques uh, at times, if, oh, yeah. if, you know, just because I like doing that as well. I'm not, uh, Brian's far more forward thinking me in some in the forward thinking than me in some areas and he will take the whole thing to an extreme whereas i sort of you know i fluctuate between the two styles between old-fashioned songwriting and this other kind of way you work well <laughs> together it does it's fantastic thank you very much barry how did heroes come about I and mean, which method did you use for that one the, the the title track that was very much a combination of uh, brian's piano technique and my piano technique, which are both dastardly and end up sending out the Velvet Underground. <laughs> I'm going to fade that there because we're getting a little late with our commercial breaks. But during that was playing, we were talking about the German version that we played on Your Mother quite a few times and got incredible response to it. And I was saying how much that there is more power. If you've heard the German version of Heroes, the single, you'll know what I'm talking about. But it's got loads of power to it, more so, more so in fact, than, than the English version. Yeah. Why do you think that was? Well, a number of reasons, I think. For... Um Atmospherically, I was in Berlin, I was looking at the wall through this, uh, probably the renowned Hansa studio by now, you can see the wall and the turret and whatever, looking at that, and also, that's where the incident was written, which is the main central theme of the song, and also, plus the fact that I was singing in a native, uh, in a foreign language, and so I was fighting the language, and I think I probably gave it more impetus, and I did that version before I did the English version. Mm. So when I eventually got to the English version, I think I might have tempered it down a bit and started getting a bit too sophisto about how I was going to deal with the interpretation. Because there was a great deal of um, interest in that German version. It would have been nice to just release that rather than you know have to go to import shops and it's changing hands now at ridiculous <laughs> prices. <laughs> Anyway, you're listening to Capital in Stereo on 95.8 and 194 meters medium wave. I'm Nicky Horn. My guest tonight is David Bowie, and Rona is uh, going to be on the phone in just a minute. Clark. And good evening to Rona. Hello, Rona. Hello, Dave. Hello, Rona. Shut up. <laughs> um, <laughs> she's been influenced by. Sorry, we, what? Didn't, we didn't get that, love. Who have your paintings been influenced by? The style of painting. Well, very simple, really. Uh, I nick a lot of ideas from... There's a, there was a school in Germany about 19... It started about 1918, uh, just at the end of the uh, First World War, a bunch of very dissatisfied artists, uh, and they called themselves the Brucker, which means the bridge. Um, and they wanted to paint in a new way, and they formed this school called the German Expressionist School. And one of them was called Eric Heckel, and I suppose if you look at a heckle and you look at some of my things, you'll think, oh, not dissimilar. Um, so it's Eric Heckle, really. Oh. But most of those guys were sort of thrown out of Germany just before the Second World War, of course. So the whole thing went into pieces, and Hitler burnt most of the, the best of the work, so not many of them survived now. No, he wasn't very nice. Um, were you ever going to see your paintings on exhibition? Um, I've... I've considered it. Uh, when I've got enough and when enough people have patted me on the head and said, very good, David, I might show them somewhere, but at the moment I don't have any plans now. OK, thanks. Thanks for calling, Rona. Good night. In fact, talking about Germany, that brings us nicely onto the film, uh, Just a Gigolo, which is going to be on general release from, uh, or selected release, rather, from uh, this coming Sunday. Um, was one of the reasons for doing the film, I, I know that a lot of people have said that because um, Marlene Dietrich, um, mm -hmm. it was her sort of first appearance for n number of years, how much was it a bait uh, for you to appear in it? Um, you know, how much of, of a bait was she for you to appear in? How much did it work the other way around? Uh, well, I think uh, um, it made an enormous impression upon me that, that uh, Miss D had uh, 
said that she would do the film if I would do it. Mm. And likewise, I said, well, if it's, if it's a promise that she's doing the film, I'll do it. Let's sort of leave it at that. <laughs> Um, she must have been terribly flattered by the fact that she that she even knew you. Oh my God, that was yeah, it was incredible. And um, she said very nice things about me. And in fact, uh, she was playing the side two of the Low album to all her friends, which I thought was just terrific. Of uh, going back to the film, or in fact staying with the film, you you once said that one of your favourite writers was Christopher Isherwood. Yes. Um, whose um, stories and books sort of formed the basis really of Cabaret. Yeah. Um, which dealt with the sort of decadence in Germany, and obviously just a gigolo um, deals with that as well. Do you have a sort of fascination for that period, and was that one of the reasons why you accepted the film? As I think well? it was the idea of, of Christopher's idea of contradictions that he he always put himself in a position that was fairly dangerous. It was the same kind of thing. He went to Germany because he thought it was the political melting pot of Europe that everything that was going to happen would show itself in Berlin. Um, that applied then, and I, I feel it has been applying over the last two or three years as well in Berlin, that all the unrest and the political unrest that's happening there, the breaking down of, of uh, ethnic groups into different areas and the, 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 um, the, the lack of sort of liaison between them mm. is starting to show itself all over Europe, but I think it started in Berlin a few years ago, and I wanted to be there. I would like to think that I was some kind of... Isherwood, and as much as I would like to say I could have observed what was happening in Europe, being mm. sort of on the outside looking in. The, the, there is this amazing fascination, though, for that time and, and the decadence that goes, that goes with it, really. Well, you wouldn't find that in Berlin now. It's, not, it's anything but a decadent city. Mm. It's decadent in as much that the, the, another, uh, one of its contradictions is that the wall is around it, not to uh, it, the wall is around there to keep the West Germans from going into East Germany. That's the official explanation for the wall. I mean, it's sort of the life is made up in that pattern there. Are you hoping to record there again, or was that just a one-off thing? Um, well, a two-off thing, really. Yeah. Low and yeah. uh, both low and heroes were sort of done there. Um, it's it's likely I might record there again. Yes. Do you, I mean, because the last time that we met, you said that you needed that, uh, the feeling of the city to actually be able to create. It, it sort of s helped the whole process. Yeah. Um, where, I mean, this new album that you're doing with Brian Eno, um, where has that been done? Has that been done there as well? It started off in Switzerland and it's drifting down to Berlin again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get back to music. And uh, one of the tracks that you chose was a thing by Link Ray. Would you like to uh, tell me why you decided uh, on this one? Uh, just the most exciting guitarist that happened during his period. All right, this is the Batman. Look, Bruce, it's the bat signal. Yes, are you ready, Robin? Yes, Batman. <laughs> Should I start the nuclear power for the Batmobile? Right again, Robin. Okay, Batman. <laughs> Link Ray, and that was the Batman thing.
It's nearly 20 to 10. My guest live in the studio is David Bowie. Going back to the movie once again, a lot of people who have seen the film in, f in its uh, new recut version have said that, in a way, your acting is rather um, wooden. <laughs> <laughs> Um, stiff. Now, well, stiff, yes. I mean, that's what a lot of people have said. I had the um, wrong trousers on, probably. Now, in The Man That Fell to Earth, um, you really had to be less of an actor in that film because there was a sort of mystical quality to the character you were playing, which is very much um, have surround, you know, I mean, that's surrounded you and has almost become your image over the last X number of years. Um, but in this film, you had to be more of an actor. You were actually directed by, obviously, David Hemmings. Yeah. Um, now... Do you, I mean, did you actually feel happy in doing this movie, or did you feel as if it was a slightly wooden well, no, <laughs> I'm not happy. Because the, <laughs> the one thing David told me was, David, act stiff. <laughs> really? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> <laughs> No, you were saying you were saying that the the guy that you play is actually a wimp anyway, and, and makes very wooden yes. movements. So a lot of yeah, well, he's only a soldier, and I think th that he's ha <laughs> he's happiest in the whole film when he's dead, because that's where he really feels at one with himself. Mm. That's, that's my excuse. Okay, we will go to the phones now. Get me out of this, Peter. Hello, Peter. Are you there? Evening. Hello. Hello. Welcome. How are you? All right, thank you. All right, there are two things I'd like to say, actually. First of all, I'd like to give you a very personal thank you, uh, because I consider that all the work you've turned out in the 70s have, has been of such an incredibly high standard, and uh, you must be one of the few artists that I can go out and buy an LP without having heard any tracks or reading reviews, and I know that it's going to be extremely good. Secondly, I'd like to ask you a question about Low and Heroes, side two. Um, I was particularly interested in this form of music, the direction that uh, this music took. I was wondering if we can look forward to any more of this type of music in forthcoming albums, and whether or not uh, it's true that the, uh, Low and Hero are part of a trilogy. <laughs> okay, well, for the first part of what you said, thank you very much. Um, for the second part, um, yes, you can. Uh, oh, terrific. Um, <laughs> I think uh, that I'll be still trying to create atmospheres and I, I think that they will sort of I'll, I'll still be bouncing off cities really for the for the atmospheres that's fantastic because subterraneans in warsaw i think were particularly and a uh, sense of doubt were particularly atmospheric in fact i'm even thinking i, I sort of make films as a, as a sort of amateur hobby and yeah i'd like to put films to these uh, music if, uh, if ah that's in funnily enough i must tell you uh it's all right mine's not coming out but i when i was in russia when i took the trans siberian express thing I took a lot of footage there, and I, I started putting those particular pieces, as, as Subterraneans and Warsaw, um, against what I'd taken on just 8 millimil. Really? Yeah, and it, 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 it is very effective. I, um, I advise you to go ahead. Oh, well, <laughs> I'm flattered. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. If you're ever in South End on sea, pop in and I'll show you my films, and you can bring yours as well. Definitely. We'll have a silly evening. Right, cheers then. <laughs> okay, one of the thank you for calling. By the way, this uh, this next record that you'd like, which plays uh, Lou Reed and Velvet Underground and White Lights, White Heat. Hey, mean guitar. On wasn't that? Wasn't was who was that? That sounded like Steve Hunter. That was wasn't the original version. No, that was um, that was from a compilation album. We yeah. didn't have the original version in the library. I'm sorry. Oh, right. it's all right. Sounded it's like Steve Hunter. Probably but wrong, but. It's just gone quarter to ten, and Tony is on the blower. Hello, Tony. Hello there. Hi. Hello, David. Thanks very much indeed for appearing on the, um, Nicky Horn show. It's a very great pleasure. Hello, Tony. Hello. I'd like to ask you two questions. Yes. First of all, um, there's a film of your Hammersmith Odeon concert, I believe. Yes, there is, yeah. Is there any chance of the general public seeing that one? Uh... I think so. I don't. I don't own it. You see, <laughs> oh, I, I really don't know. Shots of it on TV. <laughs> the, the bits of it on TV, are there? Anyway, there's also. What? The Sorry. <laughs> Did you say there were bits of it on TV? There were listed about. Oh, I expect somebody's thinking of putting it out then. Great. Also, um, I'd like to ask you. You were considering becoming a Buddhist monk. Yes. And I was just wondering whether um, the experiences you had there were of any benefit to you at the present moment. I'm not, I've never really sorted that out. I think at the time I was really sort of very earnest about it, being sort of 19-ish. Yep. Um, one does get a little overly earnest, I think, at 19. Not that it's a bad thing, I think it's very instructive to put yourself through those kinds of things. 
Um, but at, when push came to shove, I, I realised that there must be something in the West that I could adhere to rather than something in the East, that surely we must have some kind of spiritual backbone in the West. And I guess everything since has been some kind of search for it. You haven't found it yet, though? Um, I'm starting to get, a, get a, a general picture of what we possibly could be doing to look after ourselves, but I'm not, not entirely sure, no. I'm still half in dreams, half in reality. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Pleasure. Tony, thank you for calling. Okay. Cheers, good night. Um, in fact, talking of that stage film, the one that uh, David Hemmings has directed, yeah. uh, we didn't actually say when that was coming out, if at all. Is it now finished? Um, there's a little bit more to do with the editing, but then it's ready. I don't know when it's going to come out exactly. Okay, well, uh, while we have to wait for that, let us play something from uh, the stage album. This is Wazawa Live. <laughs> From the stage album. I was saying, actually, when that went on to uh, David, that it was a very brave move to start the concert off with that, when you suddenly appeared, or you were on stage with the rest of the band, instead of making the, the normal mandatory entrance. Yes. Um, and to start with something like that, when everyone is waiting for Suffragette City, um, was very brave, very brave move, and it seemed to work as well. Yes. Yes. But I was, <laughs> yeah. But I was also saying that um, on the night that I I saw you, I was sitting in about. I was lucky enough to sit in about the sixth row or something like that, and it was being filmed by by David Hemmings, and I felt very much that you were playing to the camera and not to the audience. And in that sense, because the week previous to that, I'd seen Bob Dylan in the same venue, which, as you know, is just a giant bathroom, and there was a, there was a large amount of communication uh, from the stage to the the audience, and I felt that was sadly lacking in the concert, to be honest. Was he being filmed as well? No, he wasn't. Oh, there you are, then. <laughs> but you were playing to the cameras. I, I, I guess I put about 50-50. Yeah. Yes. Um, when you're aware you, that you're being a, f um, a sort of a, a film object, I think you unhappily do play to the camera an awful lot. But at, at a gig like that, I mean, the compromise surely is to... Well, I mean, there should not be a compromise, really. Well, if life isn't compromise... No, I compromise <laughs> all down. That's the trouble. People are such extremists. Let's talk to Mark on the phone. Hello, Mark. Hello. Hi. Dave. Hello, Mark. Hello. Hello. I, was, uh, I just wanted to know whether you object to uh, your lookalikes at all. OK. There's, uh... No, of course I don't. Um... It's great. I mean, it's very entertaining for me. For the first sort of few rows that I can see. Um, but on the other hand, what do you think a lookalike does with his lookalike? Do you think he just puts it on for the concert? Um, no, when you see, you see um, lookalikes, you see Bowie lookalikes walking around the street every day. Yeah. I mean, you, you've got to admit, you, you must start off most of the well, fashion. What I was thinking is, do you think that they walk around just wanting to look like David Bowie, or do you think they walk around with a look-alike on as an alternative lifestyle? Do you know what I mean? I mean, do you think they take that look and make it their own, so that they feel they can add to it with their own identity? Um, I'm not really sure. I, I reckon they disrespect you and they uh, want to look like David Bowie. I think it's sort of quite... I, I mean, I, I did the same kind of thing myself with various people that I admired. I mean, if I sort of flashed on somebody for a, a few months or something, I'd sort of wear exactly what he wore, said what he said. Um, and I think it's important to sort of use that particular device to add to yourself or, or to find things within yourself rather than just becoming the artist or trying to sort of just be the artist that you're modelling. I like look-alikes, but I think they should use use the looks for the right reason, which is to sort of discover other little eccentricities in themselves. Yeah. Bad. Is that any kind of answer at all? Um, well, I'm a bit confused, but... Uh, Listen, so am I. Why do you think I keep changing? <laughs> intelligent than me. Um, do you mind if um, a friend of mine speaks to you, just says hello to you? Very, yes. Very uh, briefly, because we're coming up to the news. Hello, friend. Hello. Hello, friend. It's Georgina. Hi, Georgina. I just, well, it's a very quick question. When, when's your next call going to be? 1980 or 1981. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Georgina, Bye. thank you for calling. Yeah. And Mark, thank you as well. Okay, we're coming up to the news, David, so, um, 
Time to relax for a few moments. Let's go out to the news with V2 Schneider. Um, hi there, it's Capital. I'm Nicky Horn. My guest this evening is David Bowie, as he puts his headphones on. And you've asked me to play um, out of the news, which has in fact just come from the record library, um, a record by Talking Heads. Yeah. Could, while I just cue it up, because it is not yet on the turntable, could you just say why? OK, right. Well, I think it's quite relevant to the Yardbirds' shapes of things to come, really. When you listen to the lyric content of this, and when you listen to the Yardbirds, I think you've got a decade's worth of experience in there. Very good. Mm. It's great, isn't mm. it? Talking heads. We were talking about the sort of current state of music um, while that was playing, and talking about the sort of current disco thing that has uh, escalated in every chart, in every conceivable chart that there is. Disco is in there somewhere. Um, and I w we were talking about the Young Americans album, yeah. which really started soul. Um, I mean, you, it was your R and B thing, which was soul with soul. It seems to me now that a lot of the disco records are soul orientated records, but have no soul. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the sort of stuff that you can dance to. Yeah. But when you actually came to put a, come to put a pair of headphones on, I mean, it's instantly disposable. I mean, what's your feeling about the, I mean, the current state of play in that area? If you oh, know? well. I think what I was trying to capture was what was happening in, in Philly and uh, New York um, f five years or so ago, and trying to put it onto plastic. It was a rather sardonic look at it, I must admit. Um, but it was, I guess, the first of its kind. It was really white disco mm. um, at that time. It was played in discos and fame subsequently became very big and whatever. Um, but disco has taken on a new face in as much that it streamlined itself and orientated itself more toward the national heartbeat feel where the heartbeat is the thing that holds all the dancers together and I think why people do get such a kick out of it and in fact when I'm feeling sort of very isolated or out of things and I want to feel as though I am important then I will go to a disco for one reason and that is that I can compete on the dance floor with no social responsibility no responsibilities to any boss, uh, knowing that that responsibility in real life is a load of... is um, totally meaningless anyway, that, you know, you go and clock in in a factory, but where's it all going anyway, looking around? But you can go and compete knowing there is no real responsibility on your shoulders. It's a sort of... Um, you're a, a micro-corporate competitor. Mm. on the dance floor with no responsibilities. I think that has a lot to do with it. But how do you feel about the sort of disposability, if you like, of, of the music? The fact that it is, you know, here today, Oh, well, that's tomorrow, fine. That's, I mean, it doesn't, that's it great. doesn't just last. That's OK. I mean, I've always liked... I've loved disposable music. And I'll try and get you to play a thing called Paralyzed by a certain gentleman th that happened a few years ago, which was completely disposable music. Right. Um, I think... Uh, Disposable music is, is n not something of the future, but it has happened now. The only thing is that it, it's not being produced on flimsies. Do you know flimsies where yeah. it's just a bit of very thin plastic where the record's punched out onto it and it's often given away with magazines? I think that might become more important and you'll pick them up in supermarkets at a very cheap price and you can play them until they wear out and throw them away because they had no merit for longevity anyway. They are for the moment. I see nothing wrong with momentary music. Hmm. Uh, let's go to the phones, because we've ignored those for about 15 minutes, for which I apologise. Karen, hello, you're on the phone. Hello. Hi. Um, hello, David. Hello, Karen. Um, can I ask you two questions? Yeah. First of all, uh, do you think you'll ever live in London? Um, there's a, a stronger and stronger possibility, because London is, is having the same kind of friction feel that I felt in other areas of uh, the world. Um, I'm feeling more and more disorientated every time I come to London, so it's becoming more attractive to me. Good, good. I hope you come over then. And, um, where do you get them white sailors from? Where do I get them white sailors trousers from? Well, once upon a time... Are you sitting comfortably? Yes. Then we'll begin. <laughs> once upon a time, I was with the uh, Lindsay Kemp Mime Company, and there was a wonderful seamstress who worked for the company called Natasha Kornoloff. 
um, who comes from Russia, and she used to make all our clothes for us, and sort of at a moment's notice. And uh, I called her up just before the tour, and I said, uh, Natasha, make me something. So she made me something, and that was it. <laughs> Um, well, I hope you come over to London anyway, okay? I am in London. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know what I mean. You know what I know what you mean, yes. <laughs> okay. Karen, thank you for calling. Okay. Thank you. And um, talking about the, the fact that you feel uncomfortable in London intrigues me and worries me, and I think would worry a lot of people as well. Remember the last time you were here when uh, there was that wonderful incident on uh, Victoria Station? that got blown out of all proportion by the press, mm. the, 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 quote, in quotes, fascism thing. Okay. Yes, I remember it all too well. Um, do you feel that that now is sort of coming, or closer than it was? I mean, is that the uncomfortable, is that why you feel uncomfortable here? Not really, no, I think enough silly on? sods have put that party in its place, but I think the, the feeling here is the, the, the whole thing that Burgess has been saying in 1979, a novel which I relish, and I think is very accurate about the whole takeover here and and the eventual collapse of, of, of our present system to be replaced by somebody make a record about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will. Let's go back to uh, I thought I had <laughs> the young American. It's Capital and your mother wouldn't like it. My guest tonight live in the studio is David Bowie listening very intently towards the end of that in the headphones. What memories do that bring back? Can I just make an interruption and digress completely? Okay. I made a dirty mistake for poor Anthony Burgess. The title of the book is 1985. I got my years messed up. 1979 is, in fact, another book called The Crash of 79, which only applies to America. But uh, 85 is, is the book. 1985. You digressed. Do go out and buy it. Young Americans. Yeah. Yeah. What memories does it have? Mm. Oh, I think living in the Puerto Rican area of uh, New York, learning to dance Spanish style, um, going to great clubs, pretty chicks, living a life of bliss, height of fame, smashing stuff. Sounds All had to end. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> it's 20 past 10. In the news of 11, it's Kerry Juby for Tony Myers on The Late Show. Here's another one that uh, David chose. This is La Dusseldorf. La Dusseldorf. It's the sound of the Aces. Well, I've paraphrased, but that was the, uh, the implication. I think it's the, the, the folk song of the Aces. And they're part of It's craft. about an airport, yeah. and, but it also has a slight disco feeling to it. I think that combination of folk disco, folks. <laughs> folk disco. Yeah. That's it, is it? That's what we're waiting for. Now, someone would like to talk to you about reggae. I yep. believe his name is Eddie. Hello, Eddie. Hello. Hi. Hello, Eddie. Hello, how are you? I'm very well. Oh, good. Uh, I was going to ask you a film about the, uh, a question about the premiere tomorrow, but I've been told uh, there's been too many questions about that. And, uh, what did you want to know about the premiere, Eddie? Oh, well, actually, David, I've got tickets. Have you? To go tomorrow. Could you let me have a couple, love? I can't get in anywhere. <laughs> uh, with, uh... I'm going to try through the tradesman, but, you know... No, I know. I'll get somebody on the inside to open up the exit door and I'll get in. Uh, I'm going along with my girlfriend and my cousin. Yeah. I was just wondering if it'd be possible to meet you. I'll be sitting in row F15. Uh, no. Wearing a big hat and funny boots. Sorry? <laughs> no, actually, I... Wheel I'm... wave. Now, what do you want <laughs> to know about reggae? I'd like to know if you like reggae or, and if you've listened to me. My... Yeah, well, when I, when I was growing up, um, I lived in Brixton and what we heard a lot of there was Scar. Um, which was sort of, I suppose, the progenitor of reggae. It was Scar first, then it became Blue Beat, and then it ended up as reggae. So I have a certain affinity to it, with it, rather. Um, I like it, yes, it ha hasn't influenced much of what I've done, I must admit. Um, funnily enough, there is a... a, a um, I've got a cross-reference thing on the new album that I've done, wh where I've put reggae against another culture which produces, I'm not telling you the other culture, give it all away, um, which produces an interesting effect, but the, the, the fundamental beat of reggae hasn't influenced me very much. But I do like it. In fact, I corrupted one of the songs in, in uh, the last stage show, uh, What in the World, and I made it sort of reggae in the beginning. Yeah, and what do you think of New Wave? Mm. But darling, I am New Wave. <laughs> <laughs> no, have, have you ever met any of the Sex Pistols? Uh, unfortunately, 
No. Well, briefly, I met Johnny Rotten, but uh, we didn't talk. Because <laughs> I went to see an Iggy show, and he went to see an Iggy show, and sort of, he was talking to Iggy, so I sort of, being a Capricorn, sat on the back and just watched. <laughs> Eddie, thanks for your call, mate. Okay, Thank you, you cheers. Bye-bye. In fact, you were talking about uh, Brian Eno there, and when well, you are talking about the new album, one of the tracks that you've asked me to play is... Um, from Here Come the Warm Jets, uh, Eno, which uh, will play in just a moment after we take a break. But I, I heard that uh, Eno has now disappeared. He's, he's gone away. Yes. For a long holiday. What, what is Well, what story? happened is that toward the end of the album, he said, David. I said, yes, Brian. He said, David, I'm going away, David. Uh, I said, yes. He said, I'm going away for... I'm going away for rather a long time. Yes, Brian. Well, what I mean is... I'm going away for a year or two. I said, you're not serious. He said, yes, I am. And he left the next day, and I didn't hear a word from him till last week when he wrote me a letter, care of Kuala Wawalawala, or somewhere, and he's out on a desert island in the east, and he said, I'm going to stay here for another year, and I think that my whole career will be left on the beach and swamped by a new wave after new wave. Is he? Um, yes, and Brian usually carries out everything he says he's going to do, so um, I, I think he probably will stay away for a very long time, but he tends to do that. Does that uh, not present problems for the new album? Because, I mean, you're halfway sort of getting that together with Well, Brian. Brian and I have always worked in fairly peculiar sort of fashion. I mean, um, Brian goes in the studio and does something, then I go in later and do it, or I go in first and then he comes in. Very rarely do we ever work together. Fortunately, on this last one, Brian's already done everything he's going to do, and uh, I'm going in next, and I'll do my bit, and then the thing will come out. How close to completion is that album? About 50%. <laughs> <laughs> Fine! Twenty-five to eleven on this cold and wet Tuesday night. Hello, it's Capital and your mother, my guest, David Bowie, live in the studio. And that was Brian Eno and Babies on Fire. Let's go back, David, to this new album that's coming out. Yes. Have you got a tentative release date for it? Um, yes, about the first week in May. And about the style of the album, yeah. how would you describe it? Is it like um, Heroes, like Low? I mean, Okay, it's built up of contradictions and ironies. Now, I'll give you a little story, and this is sort of visually what it sounds like. Imagine, I walked into um, a punk club in Berlin, and it was green and red and white neon, and they were celebrating the anniversary of the putting up of the Berlin Wall. To celebrate this, they had had made a great big long 15-foot iced-covered cake of the wall complete with turrets and machine guns. It was put in the middle of the floor, and all the punks ate it. The album sounds like that. Sounds fascinating. First week in May. Yes. Hmm. OK, we've got someone on the phone who I believe is the conductor for the Ballet Rombe. Is that right? Have I, have I described that right, Paul? I'm one of the conductors. Ah, uh, Paul, isn't it? That's right. Hi, good evening. Hello. Good evening, Paul. It's David here. Hello. Um, I, I've got a musical question. Uh, Natasha made clothes for your lot, didn't she? You what? Natasha made clothes for your lot. That's right, and Lindsay Kemp actually has done two of the pieces. Yes, I know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, my question's a musical one. Yeah. Um, do you consider yourself, first of all, to be part of a European school of rock which is in friendly opposition with an American school of rock? And secondly, through your work with um, with Brian Eno and you know through other things that you've been listening to over the years, do you consider yourself to be influenced at all by any of the avant-garde classical composers? And if so, which ones? Um, in pure elitist fashion, I guess yes. I am part of the European school of rock. That is that succinct enough. <laughs> yeah. On the second part of the question, yeah. I mean. Um, Against that, I mean, I'm terribly influenced by people like Steve Reich and Philip Glass. Yeah. Um, so I guess there's a certain American uh, constructionist kind of feeling to some right. of the things that I do. Right. Is that full enough? 
Yeah, I was thinking more of the European people. I mean, it's not really. I mean, I can, I can sort of, I can see this, this the uh, the Steve Reich reference. Yeah. Um, but I was thinking, you know, if there was anybody European, specifically the guys who've worked with with Brian, you know. Uh, I guess not really. You know. No. No, not really. Because I didn't. I'd like to be able to say yes. Yeah, I mean, I know that you have a lot of admiration for Kraftwerk. Uh, well, let's say early craft work. Right. Well, not not so much the later stuff. Yeah. Um, I, well, I tell you what, I do like Edgar Froza a lot. Uh -huh. His solo work, not his work with Tangerine Dream. But I understand there's a very good new Tangerine album out now, but I haven't heard that one yet. Yeah. But as up, up to date, I mean, Edgar's solo work, I think, is far superior than his work with the band. Yeah. Um, as far, far as France, I think there's a lot of interesting people in France. I don't think they've actually got to where they want to go yet being yeah. the french it's sort of it's it's all still a bit uh, you know we're all very left wing but we still want to eat a good meal and you know have it covered in wine yeah okay well thank you <laughs> sorry <laughs> thank you paul okay. paul thank you for calling okay bye -bye. cheers okay here's um, something from diamond dogs and i don't think it's been played for ages this is big Brother. <laughs> Okay, I'm a dummy. I played the wrong track. Forgive me. I will now put it on the <laughs> track, right? So you are specifically for this one. Okay. Proves it's live. It's nearly quarter to eleven. David Bowie from Diamond Dogs. And uh, I think we'll probably have time for two more calls. Um, Paul, I believe you're on the line. Hello, Paul. Hello, David. Hello, Paul. Hello, I'd like to ask... How old are you, Paul? I'm 14. Hello. Hello. I'd like to ask you your opinion on the pirate cassettes and the bootlegging of concerts. Yeah. <coughs> OK, I think a lot of us have that problem, of course. Um, I think what well, the real problem... I mean, I've heard a lot of bootlegs that I like very much. I think they're really nice pieces. I tell you what. I would like the people who have those bootlegs to come to me and tell me they got those bootlegs because, having written the songs and done the performance, I'd like to be paid for them. Yeah. It's not that I don't think... I, I don't think bootlegs are inferior. Some of them have a quality of their own which will, you will never capture on a pre-recorded kind of thing where everything is sort of organised. It's not that fact. Creatively, some of them are very interesting, but I, I'd like to be paid for what I do. I've, al I've always liked being paid yeah. for what I do. That's that's uh, I think I guess that's my sum up of it, really. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and on the um, pinups record. Yeah. The last track I think on. I mean, I paid all them, didn't I? I paid Ray Davis, didn't I? Yeah. Paid Sid Barrett, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go on. Yeah. On the last track, it yeah. sounds like the Aladdin Sane record. Last track was where have all the good times gone? Um. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Is that where you, where you got it from? I'll have to re-listen to that. Well, maybe we'll, one day we'll play them back to back and see what the similarities are. Yeah. That's quite possible. I mean, you know, it's not unheard of. Um, Nicky, can I say a quick hello? Yes, of course. Uh, quick. I'd like to say hello to my mum and my dad, and Mark Franklin in Stamol, who is listening, and everyone in Class 3A of Stamol Secondary. Oh, especially everyone in Class 3A, yeah. Yeah, right? All right, thanks for calling, Paul. Good night, Class 3A. Right, bye. Iggy Pop and China Girl, 10 to 11, after the news at 11. Kerry Juby for Tony Myers, the last 10 minutes of your mother, with my very special guest tonight, David Bowie. What's happened to Iggy? Are you still in contact? Firstly, isn't that a lovely mm. track? Yes. It's very romantic, the most romantic thing I think Jimmy's recorded. Jimmy Iggy, Jimmy as we know him in the... Uh, What's happened to Jimmy? Uh, well, at the moment he's in uh, Los Angeles recording a new album, and I can tell you it's with James Williamson, all you Stooges fans, um, so it'll have a lot of the old Stooges feel to it. Mm. OK, listen, we've got time for one more telephone call, and that comes from Andy. Hello, Andy. Hello. Hi. Welcome. Hello, David. Hello, Andy. Uh, I was wondering whether you think your track, uh, 1984, will ever come to pass? Well, 
Uh, there's a bunch of writers, literary writers and rock writers, that have always had a sort of apocalyptic vision of, uh, of what the world will become uh, in the future. Um, Isherwood was sort of one, I guess. Uh, George Orwell was another. Now, George Orwell sort of inspired that track, of course, because his book was called 1984. And originally the idea was to make 1984 into a musical, but I got lost in a tangent and it became Diamond Dogs. But 1984 stayed in it. Um, I guess these days I'm feeling that I'm feeling a bit more positive than I used to feel. I think we can sort of pull through the whole thing. Um, I'd like to feel that 1984 could never happen. What are you going to do about it? What am I going to do about it? Yes. Sleep on that. Actually, personally, I can see it happening. The way things are going now. That's what I'm hearing from everybody. It's a bit despondent, isn't it? Don't think... Isn't there a more constructive attitude, do you think? Somewhere along the line, from station to station? Yes, which is a nice way to actually finish this. David, thank you very much indeed for coming in. I hope you've enjoyed it. It's, it's been, been a, jolly good fun a this lovely, year. lovely time. I've really enjoyed myself. The last time that you were here, we were talking about transience and that being very much part of everything. And yeah. during the interview, you said that you were thinking of using London, perhaps, as a base, perhaps. Yeah. Are you still enjoying that... That complete transience, that not having a base. It would be nice to pop back to a place and get a, get a newspaper of fish and chips <laughs> every now and again, in between Istanbul and Moscow, you know. Well, from station to station to airport to airport, David, thank you for coming in once again. And the next time you're here, feel free. Good night, Nicky. Good night, everybody else. Bye-bye. <laughs>